WCKNW, News Talk 980, BC's News Leader. And she joins me in studio this morning. Hi. Hi, Bill. What was your first job? My very first job was working at a fish and chip shop in Kamloops, which if you know the province, as I know you do, you know that that's in the interior. So it was a unique opportunity. I worked right across from the Kamloops uh, Blazers Hockey Club. So it was a great place to meet people and to be part of the community. What did it teach you? Uh, It taught me the value of hard work. (laughs) It taught me the need uh, to really be um, uh, with people and to attend to their needs and that even something as simple as fish and chips, uh, people liked and they would respond to and they'd come back time after time. And at that time, what did you think your future was going to be? I thought I was likely going to be a teacher or uh, or maybe a, uh, a, a physician. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be the CEO of Canada's largest credit union, that's for sure. <laughs> but in between, you were Deputy Minister of Finance. Uh, Carol Taylor was the finance minister for m- most of that time. Yep. Uh, what was that like? Well, Carol was a wonderful uh, minister to work for. She certainly, she certainly had such a brilliant way of communicating really technical information to the public and connecting with them genuinely. So I thoroughly enjoyed that time. But also working in the public service, you know, the public service is undervalued, I think, uh, by the public. And some of the smartest, most dedicated, most creative people that I've encountered in my professional life uh, work there. So it was a great opportunity to learn and to contribute. I, I, I share that. Uh, when, when I worked many years ago at the CBC, many of the really good, hardworking people who I worked with went on to do great things in the, in the private sector. A, a boss that I had actually created TSN, yeah. the sports network. He went to work for Labatt's at the time because Labatt's created the sports network. So I, I, I share your, your view that there are a lot of uh, Really, really quality people in the in the public service. But what is what is working in the public service do? What did what did Deputy Minister of Finance do to prepare you to be the CEO of Van City? Yeah, well, um, a couple of things. First of all, you know, when you work in government, uh, I think it, it's a very complex environment. You have to take into account the needs uh, of the government of the day, absolutely the needs of the public, what's happening in the economy. Uh, and there's 30,000 people, for example, that work uh, for the province of British Columbia. So it's it's highly complex from any uh, by any kind of measure. And to get anything done there, I tell you, is really hard. <laughs> and so if you can be successful in that environment, uh, I think uh, you can be successful uh, almost anywhere. And so it really taught me the value of focus. It taught me the value of collaboration. It taught me the value of listening. Uh, and it ta- taught me the value of leadership because I think that what, uh, we, see, what we see in government at its best is, is really taking the needs of the people that they serve and taking leadership position to get it done on their behalf. And uh, that's what it taught me. Uh, You were there at a controversial time. I've been uh, getting quite a bit of correspondence recently and a a, a controversy around the 25% tax cut that was implemented by the Liberal government when it came to power, and you were there at the time. Uh, When you look back on it, was that the right thing to do yeah. I was actually uh, in the Ministry of Health in 2001, uh, the deputy minister, one of two deputy ministers there. And uh, I recall that, uh, you know, at the time, our, our province was, uh, was experiencing a pretty significant uh, downturn in the economy that was precipitated by uh, worldwide events. If anybody uh, doesn't believe that the entire situation can change on a dime, certainly 9-11 unfortunately taught us that. And so I think we also forget that we had seen investment leaving British Columbia uh, in the 90s, that we didn't have a great reputation with investors. We didn't show the kind of confidence that we needed to to the investment community. And that single act was very symbolic uh, in terms of showing the discipline and the confidence that the government had to put its own house in order uh, uh, as a leadership statement to demonstrate that it was prepared to govern in the long term for the interests of the province. And you're not a political person. I am not. I've served both governments, both NDP governments and, uh, and Liberal governments. But what some people seem to forget is that there were three or four consecutive surplus budgets delivered after the tax cuts. Absolutely. Yeah, they started in 2003 uh, and went all the way through uh, up to uh, uh, almost 2008. Now, people also tend to forget that we had the worst recession hit since... The 30s. Yeah. 
in 208, 209. Absolutely. And so, again, the, the, the benefit of hindsight is, of course, as the, as the saying goes, it's always 2020. And so when we look back, we say, well, could we have taken some of that money and put it in reserves? But, you know, in my experience, that's not what we would have done. There would have been, there's always more demands than there are supply when you're in the government. And we would have, I think, found ways uh, to spend that money. And it would have been good ways, but they wouldn't necessarily have been the ways that would have been sustainable over the future. I, I think it's, it's just not uh, practical to think that what we know now with the significant uh, financial events that we've had in, uh, uh, over the last few years, we would have known then. And so we just, we just simply wouldn't have made those, those investments. And I think the investments that we did get from the private sector, our AAA credit rating, which was very, very difficult to earn and very easy to lose, unfortunately, that really allows us to <coughs> borrow uh, at a rate that's far less. It's just like if you have a great credit rating yourself, right? You go into your bank, you get a better rate than, uh, than somebody that doesn't. And when we're competing for money, that's really important. That means that we can put more money into the services that people want. Uh, to Van City, what... What makes Van City stand apart? Yeah. Van because it does. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I'm glad you think that. I certainly think that. Van City is a great, uh, a great organization. Its, its origins are very closely tied to the origins of the city. You know, we are called Vancouver City Savings Credit Union. Uh, and we started in 1946. Uh, we, uh, we started when people who were living east of Main Street at the time uh, couldn't get a mortgage. You know, they're returning in 1946 from the war, and they just wanted to settle down and help build this community. But unfortunately for them, you know, they're working people. Uh, they lived east of Main Street, and at the time, it's not like banks didn't know how to provide mortgages. Of course they did, but they thought those houses wouldn't be worth anything. They thought those schools wouldn't be any good. They thought no business would ever want to locate there. So they said no. So in a spirit, with a spirit that I, I think really is still part of our organization today, 14 people got together. Each contributed twenty-two dollars. Fourteen people. Fourteen people. Amazing. Uh, and founded the credit union, and they started to provide those loans to one another, and from there, it's grown to almost four hundred eighty thousand members, sixteen billion in assets, but has never twenty-five hundred employees. I think our members were really prescient. Hey, those same houses that the banks wouldn't lend to are worth I don't know one point three million dollars on average today. And so it's always been part of the community. It's been part of supporting the community, supporting the community to grow, supporting the community's diversity, and supporting the community on its own own terms. And I think that's been the secret of its success. So what's the difference between a big credit union and a bank? Yeah. So I think the biggest difference is we're owned by the people we serve. So we, uh, we don't have shareholders. Uh, our members are our owners. And so there's no third party in the transaction demanding, as they do of bank CEOs, for their return on their shareholder investment. We can put all of the returns back into the value of, of the organization and the values that the, uh, that the members hold. So that's why we're able, for example, to contribute 30% of our uh, income uh, back to members and communities. Banks contribute, I think, on average 1% because they have other people that they have to uh, pay those dividends to. Talking with Tamara Vrooman, uh, CEO of Van City, part of our series, the first in our series of uh, visits with chief executives, people who have been uh, extremely successful and lead big and important companies and organizations in our community. We'll have much more right after this. The first in our series of up-close and personal profiles of uh, Chief Executive Officers in British Columbia today, Tamara Vrooman, CEO of Van City. It's a remarkable story. You were telling me it started with 14 people and it is now 2,400 employees. That's correct. Yep. 2,400 employees, 59 branches in, uh, in uh, Victoria and throughout Metro Vancouver as far up as Squamish and, uh, and as far east as uh, Chilliwack. How difficult is it or how different is it today? And I'm trying to get my head around this question because 20 years ago it would have been very appropriate, but it still seems to be on the minds of people. Being a woman a chief executive, there are not many of you. Uh, is the world different for a woman heading a big company or a big organization like uh, Van City? 
Yeah, it, it is different. You know, even in our organization with the community roots, with our many of our founders, those 14 people, five of them were women uh, at the time. I was the first uh, woman to lead uh, to lead Van City. So it and, and I honestly think that uh, part of the reason that that I was chosen is we, because we had a majority of women directors on our board. And so I think there is a very direct correlation there between their comfort level and understanding uh, the difference that different people People, different cultures, different genders, different ages bring, and wanting to see that difference celebrated at the community. How many boards would have a majority of women? I know. It? I always joke that I think Van Cities is the only board in the country looking for a few good men. But we do have <laughs> uh, we do have uh, a majority of uh, of women on our board, and I think it reflects the fact that we are community based. Uh, we are uh, we are uh, innovative, uh, and we do have our members uh, who are obviously equally men and women uh, electing and and choosing uh, to have women represent them at the board table. Where do you see BC's economy in three years? I think BC's economy um, uh, will continue to do well. We are blessed uh, with geography and abundance. But I think the real challenge for us uh, is to not be complacent or, dare I say, arrogant as a result of that. Uh, you know, we, we have, we can't just take our, our um, natural advantages uh, for granted. And I, I really worry that I don't see enough focus on how we're going to be competitive uh, in the future. So are we just going to be hewers of wood and drawers of water? Are we just going to be a gateway that everything passes through? Or are we going to be uh, like so many other places are, are considering being in the world, you know, a place, a destination where people come? And as a result of our geography, as a result, do we have spin-off uh, industries? Do we have a vibrant consulting financial sector that supports the traffic that comes through a port and our airport? Do, are we really connecting not only uh, in a personal and a family sense, but in a cultural and in a business sense with Asia, not just as a pass-through, but uh, understanding that we as Canada are actually part of the Pacific. So country. how would you like to see that evolve? I think that we need to get more uh, more focus on uh, on the longer term. I think there's lots of opportunity for business to come together to talk about how it is that we can take advantage of those uh, of those competitive advantages. I think you know we, we have so many great mining companies, forestry companies, energy companies. but that's not going to be enough in the future. So what are we doing to build and start to seed? industry and innovation around them. For example, in our own business, we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs quite interested in distribution models, in service models, in supply chain that support those sectors. Are we nurturing them? Are we bringing them together? Are we finding them business mentors? Are we nurturing that in the same way we, and celebrating that in the same way we, we do our, our natural resources? I, I think we still have a ways to go. What's the role of the credit union or the banks in terms of uh, helping that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as financial institutions, our job is not uh, to, to make money by moving money. It's to take our capital and to invest it in, uh, in the community. And when you think about it, where you allocate capital today probably is the single biggest determinant on the society that you're going to have in the future. So it's a big decision. And so if we are investing in local entrepreneurs, if we're investing in the infrastructure that, that they need to, to support their business growth, that's going to dictate how strong those are, those are in the future. If we're taking all our money, putting it in for short term, taking it offshore at the earliest opportunity to make a return, that's also going to dictate the kind of economy we have in the future. So I think there's an opportunity for us to put more patient capital into our community, to work more with entrepreneurs, not only in terms of lending money to them, but also in terms of the intangibles. Do we mentor them? Do we set them up in peer-to-peer -peer relationships? Do we celebrate their successes and their innovations? Those are all things I think we can do. Is a credit union, especially Van City, more likely to support small business than the big banks? Uh, we certainly do well in that segment. Uh, we're certainly very competitive there, and, and we have a significant market share. You know, what we want to do with, uh, with uh, small business is the same thing I think our small business members want to do. We'll start when they're small, but then we want to grow with them and help them to become big businesses. Do they stay uh, with you when you do that? For the most part, they do. Uh, for the most part, they do. We have so many members. Uh, they're so generous. They, they, my personal phone number at work is uh, on our website, and my, my business colleagues say, are you crazy? Doesn't everybody call you more? 
morning, noon, and night. And I say, uh, actually, they do, but usually with compliments, hey, about staff, about what we've done for them. And we have so many members that are among the largest uh, independently owned businesses in town who say, you know, I started out uh, as an immigrant from India. Nobody would give me a loan because I wore a turban. I bought my first taxi cab from you. have been very progressive. And we've been with them ever since. So, yeah, they stay with us. They're loyal because they understand what it means to help them out.